I have scribbled out a litany of questions um, which I am going to systematically throw at Etienne and Tara. Will you take the stage, Dr. Swart? Okay. It's quite nice to be called Dr. Something, isn't it? I was once introduced as having a PhD. I enjoyed it for about 30 seconds. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to admit I didn't have one. <laughs> um, so, are you comfortable? I just think Tara's not going to be heard. Is she on? Tara's not going to be heard. Are, are you, you on? on? Yeah. Is everybody oh, on? Sorry, Tara that. on? Testing. Okay. Tara's on. Everybody's on. Do you mind if I just move the cups? Okay, fine. Um, so I thought I'll kick off the Q&A and then uh, we'll open it up to the floor. Just in this section, if you do ask a question, please make sure that you do have the microphone in front of you before you start speaking. Fair trade? Great. So I'm going to take the stage. It feels a bit like a television show, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. It changes the whole Does it really? <laughs> Just pretend you're on business day TV or something like that. Uh, right. The, today's topic is neuroscience for leadership. And um, many people in the room are in business, are leaders, leading other people, are responsible in some instances for transformation. Uh, I was fortunate to get my hands on Tara's book, Neuroscience for Leadership, um, ahead of the session. And if you open your book on the inside, on the leaf, it says something very interesting, which has been a long debate for uh, leadership developers for centuries, actually. And you say leadership can be learned. Page one, sentence one. <laughs> so if leadership can be learned, because we've always said, do you, are you innately a leader? Do you mm. develop leadership skills? That's a very clear statement. Leadership can be learned. So I thought I'd address this to Tara. If that is true, mm. how in neuroscience do we learn the skill of leadership? Well, thank you for that <laughs> very <laughs> difficult question. Um, yeah, so I think... Yeah, everything starts with awareness. So the first thing is that if you know, if you look back to the nature-nurture debate, and then you think about are leaders born or are they made, and what we know about neuroplasticity, then you really have to now be open to the fact that leaders can be made. Um, so being aware that that's possible for you is a start. So if you think back to, if we go back to Carol Dweck's work, um, she gives an example of a school, a classroom, where the teachers are told that we've, um, tested all the children for IQ, and we've put the clever children on the right-hand side of the room, and we've put the not-so-clever children on the left-hand side of the room. The teachers treat those children completely differently. Wow. And so the same happens with people that are put into high-potential pools in business and people that aren't. Wow. Um, I mean, I don't think I really need to say much more. That's kind of, that's, that's the start, and then it's, it's what you do with that. And, you know, we've talked about some of the um, sort of in, you know, physical factors that need to go into developing your brain, but then there's also the training, the experience, the mentoring. Um, it's it's but not these really are all yeah. tangible skills that you mm. actually can do something about. But that's quite a frightening um, reality that how you treat somebody is how they are most likely to manifest. Mm. And while we know that innately, we have to wonder how many times we treat people perhaps in an inappropriate way. Or let ourselves be treated in That's, yeah. such a way. Yeah. yeah, there's always two rules of leadership. Rule number one is it's not about you. And rule number two is it's all about you. <laughs> 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 That's why we have doctors. <laughs> Etienne, this one's targeted straight at you. Uh, I loved your comment, the brain is a problem-solving machine, and yet problems need to be adapted by the group. So it struck me is that if you're a leader and you think you have the perfect solution, so you have applied your problem-solving machine to solving the most complex of problems, but now the group does not want to adapt to your solution, how can you use neuroscience to foster some level of collaboration or adaptability when you now have a divide between perception of solution? Sure. <laughs> That's even worse than the first question. <laughs> I think what is important to understand is that, um, f first of all, there are a number of things. If, if you have a leader um, 
who has a ranking leadership style and probably a high and is a high powered individual. Uh, you probably have a bit of a problem when you have to when you have to deal with problems in the typical day to day problems in a, in a typical modern business uh, where we are not at war, even though we use the words kill and uh, you know and, and, and hostile takeovers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is this is not a war, uh, and it's also not an uh, an operation hospital theatre, and it's it's also not necessarily the the bottom of a mine. I use these examples because this is typically where you need serious ranking leadership style. So, and, and they have three things, those three areas have one thing in common, and that is it's, it's, it's a life and death situation. Mm -hmm. And so if, it, it's, if it's a matter of life and death, the leadership requirements are fairly different. Right? So we talked a, a bit about situational leadership here now. If you have an individual who is at war in a, in a boardroom, it's a, it's, it is in itself, I think, a big problem. And so I would, I would advise that leader needs a serious executive coaching. Um, <laughs> Uh, because there's, a, there's probably, a, and I would, I would argue there might be a mindset, of com a competitive mindset somewhere lurking in that, mm -hmm. in, that, in that armory where you are looking for abundance. And abundance, once again, is that there's an abundance of resources around me, in, around my individuals, in, individuals around the table who have potential very sophisticated solutions to the problem. What I would recommend, and we often do this, is if you want to leverage the neuroscience, you have to leverage the unconscious problem solver. Unfortunately, the unconscious problem solver is not the only thing that the brain does unconsciously. If you start to adapt a process where a problem which the leader thinks he or she has an answer to already, put this to the group, ensure that it's conceptualized, and leave it with the group and him or herself for a while, and hopefully, as I said, over a night of good sleep, the, you would be quite... And, and we, we do see now with the studies that's been done on the, on the so-called C-factor and collective, so-called collective intelligence uh, in, a, in a group, you, you'd be quite astounded to see what, what kind of uh, solutions and sophisticated solutions come to the to forefront. So the C-factor always trumps the, G, the, in the highest individual G, mm. provided that there are a number of, of conditions in place. And this is an, a, res a responsibility of a leader. So I'm a little bit off the topic, but and not off the topic, I would recommend that every leader understand that those, those um, under, what we understand now, conditions that need to be pre present is you have to have a equal gender, uh, equal, equal gender um, distribution in your, in your team. You need uh, to have compassion and empathy, and everybody has to have the same turn-taking um, ability. Now, immediately, the, the, your leader who's actually in control has a problem or mm -hmm. creates a problem. And so you need that in your group for for, your, for innovative solutions. I would really leverage the unconscious in that sense and see where that comes uh, lead you to as opposed to trying to solve from meeting. Yeah, and in uh, Liz Wiseman, yeah. who's an, it, it's our next conference, she wrote a book called Multipliers. Yes. And in there, she set up a system of debate mm -hmm. and she studied leadership and she said some of the best leaders use the concept of questioning to extract value from the people in the room but also a very deliberate debate system, which people can prepare for. But the caveat of the debate is when you get in the room to debate your point of view, after you have positioned yourself as having defended one particular view, they then turn it around and get you to argue the opposite side. Right. And right. through that process, they found that they extract some of the highest value um, adapted right. um, problem solu uh, solutions to problems. May, yeah. may I add another, yeah, another sure. potential Absolutely. practical uh, way of, of dealing with this? Mm. If, if, if the high-powered individual is the leader, I would recommend that the leader then uh, adapt another, another approach, which is to use the so-called generic path technique. Um, it's fairly well known in uh, problem solving. So the generic path technique simply means that you, uh, I'll give you a simple example. If you have two metal rings and you have a candle and you have a match and now you can light this candle, how, how can you, and how many ways can you put these two metal rings together and actually form a, an H? So the first thought would be, oh, no, we can just burn the candle, we'll put it in the wax, or we'll put the wax around it, and they will form an H. Yeah, but sure, that's, that is a good solution, but it's not the best one. And so the genetic parts say, break up everything you've got into its smallest parts. You see, you go to the building blocks of knowledge, right. and, then you, and then see how many, in how many ways all these generic parts can be put together by your unconscious brain you come up with a better solution. So now you say, I've got a metal. It's a ring, it's metal. What does it consist of? So you actually start to put all these things together. 
You have a, a candle, you say, okay, there's a wick and there's wax. Yeah. And there's a, a match. So you burn away the wax, you've got a wick. So you take this piece of rope and string it to string the two metal rings together. And that's a way better solution. I think everybody has happy that it's more yeah. satisfactory. If everybody starts to contribute to the generic part, you are probably also bound to remove that leader's w first and only solution. Yeah. That's very interesting. Pick picking up on the, the first comment you made, you said about gender diversity. And this one I'm going to throw at Tara. And it's a bit of a thank spin you. of a question. <laughs> you did a great job, and thank you. But you, you gave us a fascinating analogy around gender and racial equality. And I think you said you had a dead body, and you were all dissecting it over a period of time. And then you mentioned how you couldn't tell certain differences by uh, dissecting and looking at things under microscope. And then you threw in a Dolce & Gabbana moment, and you said, but I could probably tell if you're gay. Yeah. Yeah, they're happy um, or just otherwise? Yeah, so I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I probably have the slide on my computer, but I don't know if I would be able to find it now. But um, there was something, a paper published in the, what is it? The Academy of the Proceedings of the National Academy of National Science. Academy yeah, of Proceedings Science. of the National Academy of Science. It was also in the um, Wall Street Journal. It's a few years ago now, and it shows uh, four sets of brain scans, male heterosexual, male homosexual, female heterosexual, female homosexual. And it sh this one showed um, brain scanning activity to a, an emotional um, item, which was a photo of a child crying or you know, something, a sad photo. And although there are some structural differences between homosexual and heterosexual brains that you can see on brain scanning, wow. but in this res amygdala response to um, this sad emotional photo, it, what you could see is that the female homosexual response was closer to the... No, let me get this right. So male, male heterosexual mm. was one, on one extreme. Next was female homosexual, then male homosexual, and then female heterosexual. So the, emo the diffuseness of the emotional response was quite markedly different between those four. And um, gay women's response looked more like straight men's response. Heterosexual yeah. male. That's fascinating. Mm. There was many years ago, I read a book called Brain Sex. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you ever read it. It, and it was fascinating. It was based on research done in rats, um, and it studied the fetal development of rats, mm -hmm. and they periodically injected a hormone mm -hmm. at a certain stage of fetal mm -hmm. development, which they knew coincided with brain development. Mm -hmm. What they subsequently did is then tested the behavior patterns of the mature rats based on the hormone mm -hmm. um, injection. It was a very deliberate thing. And rats that had been injected with testosterone mm -hmm. were more masculine, mm -hmm. and rats that had been injected with estrogen demonstrated more feminine results regardless of the sex. Mm -hmm. was, I mean, it was, it was yeah. about 15 years ago that I read that. Sure. Yeah, worth a read. Now I've got more questions. Hold on. They're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one was, if your brain performs better, and this is at Etienne. Mm. If your brain performs better in a relaxed physiological state, um, and this is a reference now to people being at work, and you consider as people who employ people in organizations, work can sometimes be the most unrelaxed physiological environment for the brain. Mm. How do we create environments at work that support a relaxed state because a lot of what we've heard food, diet, napping, <laughs> meditation <laughs> are sort of contradictory to typical work environments and, and work patterns. What do you recommend? Cape Town. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> I'm assuming we don't all move to Cape Town. Uh, okay, uh, I think this is uh, there's an interesting um, I think what is what, what is what is what is quite important is to, to to just understand that a relaxed physiological state 
as we said, does not mean apathy, and also does mm. acute stress also not mean it's bad. And okay. so acute stress is essential. Uh, how long is acute stress? It's a question about a, a, a bit of a piece of string question. But mm. acute stress, the way we understand acute stress or so-called eustress is that you can always see the end of the stress coming. There's, mm. So there's an assignment or something. I have to complete it, so I'm, I'm stressed out. But when it's done, it's mm. over. It's fine. Mm. So the anticipation that, it's, that I, I, I can actually get around it, I, can, I have a grip on it, is, is quite important. So chronic stress, uh, one, of the, one of the ways of looking at chronic stress, and I'm sure there are many more ways, uh, is that I can't see the end of it. I can't get around it. This is an endless problem. And even if it's a small problem and I have low resilience, it can lead to the chronic stress state, which is mm. a degenerative state. Really. It degenerates mm. the system and decomp it's a decompensating system. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's usually important to understand that's the first as an important um, point. If, if you have people in the workplace who are, have to perform work, uh, even if they sit in a little cubicle that creates a little uh, oasis for them uh, in terms of sounds and visual and whatever that is, uh, while they're doing the work, if, they, if, they're not meant, if it's not me and I'm not meant to do the work, the chronic stress that, in, that, that, that follows or, or could ensue if the resilience is fairly low, which it can become if a number of things started.